Access more. Hey, everybody, welcome to the Dream Big Podcast. I'm so glad that you're with us. And I am so glad I'm with Shane Kimbra. Like, what a good guy. If you don't know Shane, it's you are not on earth uh, because he actually oftentimes isn't on earth. Shane, welcome to the uh, podcast. I'm so glad you're part of this thing. It is great to be with you, Bob. Thanks for even thinking of me to be on here. So look forward to sharing a few minutes with you today. Are you kidding me? This is so fun. I love having friends on because um, I, I don't know if I knew the guy that started DeLorean, I actually wouldn't care because it'd be like, that. just something. I don't want to just talk to somebody who did something great, but then nobody can relate to what it is they did. But who knows an astronaut? Um, I remember being at a uh, up at, down in Texas and your family was there and we were eating some great barbecue and you were hovering in the International Space Station above. And I remember sending you a message and you wrote back right away and I didn't see it for a month. I was like, no. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know that until now. So uh, yeah, sometimes those things get lost, but we do have great capabilities on the space station to connect via email and even phone calls and uh, uh, even snail mail every now and then. So it's it's a pretty, pretty nice setup. Tell us about your life and career and as an astronaut, commander of the International Space Station. For people who haven't come across you yet, tell us about who you are. Yeah, well, I've been super blessed to uh, be in a really a life of service my entire life, and I really hold that dear. I, I was a career military officer in the Army, uh, flew Apaches for the United States Army, and about half of my Army career was at NASA. Uh, so I came down here mid-career, made a little kind of derailed off the mainstream Army path, and got lucky enough to be selected as an astronaut in 2004. Um, I've been able to fly a few times, fly, I've flown three missions on three different spacecraft, which is a bit unusual. And so very blessed in that regard. I flew on space shuttle and I got the, the really the privilege of flying with the Russians back in 2016 and 17. And then uh, most recently, a few years ago, I flew on kind of the new shiny toy in the space business, the SpaceX Crew Dragon. And that was a pretty fantastic ride. Oh my gosh. I know uh, you are a man of faith. You're just a good guy. You know about availability to people and how to love people well. How do you like understand uh, your life and your faith and your worldview from a guy that has this vantage point of being kind of up and above the world as you're looking down from a different vantage point than most of us will ever experience? How has that shaped your worldview? Yeah, it's such a, an incredible view, obviously, that you're alluding to that we have. And honestly, the, the human brain and the human eyeball, I don't think it can ever do it justice. It's that spectacular. Um, seeing our planet from you know several hundred miles above it is, is very special. And I don't take any of that for granted. Um, and I, I don't think it changed my perspective at all. I, I was grew up as a, in a Christian family. And, uh, you know, grew my faith throughout my adult years on my own. And, and when I finally got to see our beautiful planet from that perspective, it just kind of validated everything that I believed. Yeah. Um, it just gave me that nice validation factor. And, and it, I was like, of course, God created this, right? No, nothing else could have happened that um, made this, this incredible thing that beautiful, that spectacular um, no matter where I was looking on earth, it didn't have to be the beautiful, you know, Bahamas. It could have been the desert of Australia or the desert uh, of Africa. And they were stunning and beautiful in their own right. So it's just helped me appreciate literally our entire planet because I got to see almost all of it from that perspective at various times. Uh, maybe just something I didn't have that perspective before. I was, you know, very fond of places I've been and where I'm from and those kind of things. But now I'm really um, fond of our entire plan. And obviously I want to protect it and, and keep it. And, and maybe that's a different perspective I have after coming back and seeing the earth from that, from that vantage point. I know uh, we were talking one of the first times we met about the, um, this weightlessness. And then when it was time to like take the moonwalk, it wasn't the moonwalk, but the spacewalk. Uh, and like, how did you like, what was the mind? Like what was going on in your mind as you open the hatch <laughs> and it's time to go? I mean, my only experience so far has been seeing a movie called Gravity. <laughs> <laughs> so I just told you everything I know about it. Very so. Well, <laughs> 
that'll take scare a... anybody. If you saw just saw gravity, that'll scare anybody. But um, obviously, it's a very the stakes are very high when you're doing a spacewalk. It's certainly the most dangerous thing that any of us are ever asked to do. Um, because you're going outside in an environment that is very unforgiving. Um, it's a vacuum. There's no air to breathe. You're completely relying on that spacesuit to protect you. Uh, and you and a partner will go outside and you're, you're out there about seven hours at a time. Um, and you're doing incredible work, whether you're fixing something that's broken on the space station or you're installing new equipment, you're going to prolong the life of the space station. So, you know, anytime you're doing something that's way bigger than yourself, it's very rewarding. It's very challenging, uh, very demanding environment out there. But to kind of get your question about opening that hatch, as soon as that hatch opens, of course, it's game time and uh, yeah. you don't. I didn't, you know, a lot of people kind of, when you come out, you're always, you're always facing earth. When you come out, a lot of people have the sensation of falling to earth, right? Not something you want to feel at that moment because you got a lot of work ahead of you. Uh, I, I didn't have that sensation. Thank goodness. Um, and part of it's because I just didn't, didn't even enjoy that view. Right. I just was so focused on where I was going, mm. what I was supposed to do in that first five, 10 minutes. I always felt that first 10 minutes or so of your spacewalk really kind of defined how the rest of the day was going to go. And so we might me and my teammates always rehearse that over and over and over so that we knew those first 10 minutes were going to go well. And if we could just make that happen, then the rest of the day was going to go much better. So uh, it was an incredible, incredible experience. I got to do um, nine of those, I think now. And, wow. and you know, it's kind of hard to even imagine that uh, somebody like me could, could do something that, you know, that many times. Uh, but we got to, again, you know, really help out the space station. For a guy that writes books every once in a while, I mean, this just sounds like a book, a leadership book, <laughs> like what you do in that first 10 minutes. Um, the uh, uh, We were together in Houston and uh, by the big pools where you practice things. So when you step out of the space station and into space, that kind of isn't the first time that you've experienced or practiced that maneuver. Can you walk us through how that works? Yeah, so there are two, there's two of us crammed in a very small area called the airlock, and you're literally on top of each other. One person's head facing one way, the other person's head facing the other way, uh, and you have all your equipment in there as well. So there's there could be bags of things, all your tools on you, anything that you're going to take outside to either install or or even remove. And so you open up that hatch, which is not not trivial. It's very challenging just the way the mechanism works. And it takes some a lot of physical strength, uh, which is not great because you don't want to use all that, especially right at the beginning of a long day. Uh, but you have to um, get that hatch open. And then the first person comes out, you hook up your safety tether. That's the really one of the most important things, obviously, so that if you happen to let go, you won't go floating off into space, but you'll go back to where that tether is anchored. Uh, when I was the lead spacewalker and going out first, I would always hook mine up and my partners up. So I knew, you know, I knew I was the one that did it and I was responsible and I wanted to take that responsibility on myself to make sure that we were going to be in a safe configuration um, as the day got started. When you uh, do a, a maneuver like that, is that something that's practiced in the pool first? Do they have a, can you describe, do they have like a version of the International Space Station or whatever platform you're walking into? Is that already in the water and you've done that practice it a couple times? Absolutely. Uh, the whole space station is literally in the pool. It's that big. Um, as you as you remember seeing in the airlock, which is the part that we we come out of, is is mocked up very well in there. Um, you know, you still have gravity to deal with. So when you go upside down, you you kind of do a flip. If you're, you're the first person coming out, you do kind of a flip um, to get out. And in space, it doesn't. You know, there's no effect there at all. But but in the pool, there still is, right? And so you'll kind of get a little head rush of blood as you're as you're doing your little flip. But then once you get upright. Um, then you have to deal with the buoyancy issues, which which are always a little bit interesting in the pool. But uh, it's such a great training environment, even though it's not perfect because there still is gravity in the pool. Uh, but the, the dive team and everything that helps us out there really simulates microgravity um, as well as you can, especially in that 200 to 300 pound spacesuit that we're wearing as well. Crazy. Uh, I'm interested, too, in how you've balanced having a, a family that's really tight. Didn't you just have a wedding in the family? 
Is that yeah, even- right after I returned from space, we had one about 10 days after I landed. <laughs> so oh. that was a little tight. <laughs> We're kind of on a little close. How cool is that? Who gets to say that? Hey, I flew in for the wedding. This right. is like who traveled the furthest to get here. <laughs> <laughs> um, when you uh, w- give us some insight, like how uh, you keep your family tight and intentional, because everything you do about your life, you just project like intentionality and purpose. Give us because uh, people are listening who are single. Some people are married. Some people are in relationships and. Um, give us some pointers, some things that you've used to keep your family tight while you do, you know, a little bit of traveling. Well, the, obviously the glue that's holding all of it together is my incredible wife, Robbie. Um, she's been, obviously we've been together 32 years now, married and uh, dated a few years before that, but um, she's been the one. And I think the army honestly actually prepared us a bit for an, for a life like this, right? Where we're, we're deployed a little bit, you come home for a bit. Um, when I was doing that in the army, we were married, but we didn't have any children. Um, and then we started having children as we kind of made the transition going to graduate school and then ended up at NASA. And so that was a different kind of piece of, of the puzzle that, uh, we didn't have to deal with back then. But then at NASA, when I started leaving for, for bits off the planet, um, our kids were in different phases of their life. So my first mission when they were really young, um, they didn't really care. They just knew they got to hang out at the beach with my, with their cousins, right? And had a great time. Yes. <laughs> they didn't grasp the whole thing. But as they got older in my last two missions, they definitely understood it. The stressors were a little bit different. Um, I have a mate, three amazing children that were just, you know, been super blessed. And, and kind of to your point of, we tried to keep things as normal as possible, even though it's this crazy world we lived in. And, uh, but, and that was our normal but I mean, even like things like homework, uh, when I was on the space station and the kids had trouble with homework, um, they'd email it to me and I'd look at it and give them some answers. Right. And, and just try to keep it as normal as possible, if that's even normal. Right. But just so that they knew they had, you know, a dad that could still look at a math problem because mom was doing the English part of it or whatever. And, uh, and we just kept the kind of that tag team going. Um, and part of it, I think part of your, your question, I, I'm, I'm assuming part of it is kind of like, um, what's my identity, right? What do, what do I want to be remembered by? And it's, you know, the astronaut thing, the army thing were absolutely incredible, but I want to be remembered as, as a great husband, a great father and a great friend, right? Yeah. More than any of that. Um, and, and even above that is, you know, a God fearing Christian man. Um, and then those other things kind of just fall in line. Um, again, I've been fortunate enough to do some amazing things, but boy, what do I want to be remembered by? What is my identity? I hope it's those other things I mentioned, you know, being a Christian, a great, great husband, father, and friend. Yeah. Sometimes for each of the people listening, there may be something that you accomplished in a big stage or a small stage, but it's, it's what you're known for by your peers. It was an accomplishment. Some people are known for a big failure. There was something that, uh, you had a misstep and then everybody heard about it. And, um, the, the wisdom that you have of taking this longer arc to say, what's going to actually outlast me. Uh, like when all, when you blow the foam off the top of the latte, like what's the thing underneath it. And I love that your idea is like kind of faith and family, uh, but you have these other dimensions, like you deal with ambiguity all the time. Because what you're doing, it it isn't pedestrian, like it's um, your whole life, whether it's in service in the army or in the up above the atmosphere, Uh, but you deal with ambiguity all the time. How do you approach ambiguities now back on earth? Like you're just trying to decide, do I do this or do I that? If if we could peek in your brain, how does that work? Because I would imagine some of the imprinting, some of the lessons you've learned in these really demanding uh, places, like apply themselves to the ambiguity of either relationships or next moves, or Mm -hmm. do we stay here? Do we go? Can you give us just a peek at how your brain works and thinking through when there's two things. Do you put it all down on a paper and draw a line down the middle or the yeah. pros and cons or do you, what's your process? Yeah, that's, I wish I had the magic formula there, but really uh, it comes down to my wife and I just discuss things. We communicate. Um, we're not perfect, but we've found out over the years that that's the best way to handle any ambiguity, right? Is to, to talk through it, talk through the pros and cons, like you mentioned, and then make a decision. And sometimes it's not the right decision, honestly. I mean, even though we did kind of all our homework and we did something and made some decisions, it's not always the perfect one or the right one. 
Uh, but I think without doing that, then you're going to make a lot more decisions that you may regret down the road. So, as long, um, you know, being on board together as a team for us has been very important. And that's through parenting and through through all the other phases of life that we've been through. We just think it's it's super important. Um, and we've learned that through through incredible mentors that kind of were a few laps around the track and ahead of us um, in life. And uh, we've tried to adopt those as, as best we could because, you know, communicating and and just make, even communicating with our children and making sure they know kind of the big picture of what's going on and why we may made a certain decision and um, those kind of things is just very important to keep everybody on the same page. Yeah, I really like the idea of having people that are, uh, to borrow the phrase, in orbit around you. <laughs> <laughs> I just couldn't well, resist. But well, like to bring people close that are not the loudest voice, but the truest voice. So like that idea for me, I have a lot of people that are offer input, but I have a very small group of uh, friends that I've just kind of let on the inner core. Um, the people that are just acquainted with me might uh, experience one version. It's an authentic version, but it's just not the whole thing uh, mm -hmm. that um, if people expect something of you uh, at, with your background and experience, um, they may not know that other side of you that is longing for, like for me, it's grandkids now. So mm -hmm. a lot of people know me as a guy who's super available, but what I want to do is I'm changing that to get more available to my kids and their grandkids, like, or my so grandkids. Great. Yeah. Yep. And the crazy part about that is it's the last few seconds where the kid will actually know you're there. Like I can go to swim practice and the whole time in swim practice, they've just got their head in what they're doing. Uh, but I'm there the last five or 10 seconds. I get to wrap the towel around them when they get yeah. out. I mean, <laughs> I think that's it. And I can't do that from Pittsburgh. I right. can't do that from Buffalo. I can't do that from Orlando. So what I'm trying to do in my life is make some changes to become the next version of me, not the one that everybody knows, which is the guy that's available. And I'm a pretty upbeat guy, but so I've like the happy available old guy. Now I'm trying to be the guy that's available and stays a little bit closer to home. So my question is this, what's the next version of you? Tell me about the next Shane. Well, I hope it's very similar to what you just mentioned, right? We're our children now are all out of college. A couple have just graduated the last few weeks and out of graduate school. Um, our son's in flight school for the Army now. So they come on. We're in a new phase of life, which is amazing. Um, my wife and I are obviously growing, growing closer again because we were gone for a bit. And that's a fantastic phase. Um, and at some point we'll have grandkids like you're talking about. And I and we certainly want to be available when that happens um, for our kids and for our grandkids' sake. And uh, just having those special moments is going to be great. Um, I took a new new position, a new job. And so that was a big decision to kind of leave NASA and leave the government in general and go kind of down a different route. And so a lot of conversations were had between Robbie and I. And I was, bet. Um, But it was very clear. I mean, it was uh, very clear it was time to do something different and even get out of the, the space industry in general. Um, and great opportunity came came. Um, my way or our way, I should say. And it's yeah. been really fantastic. I couldn't ask for a better transition, not knowing really what corporate America was like. I've heard about it, of course, a lot of my buddies work in it and it's not always great, but uh, we've been super blessed so far with this incredible new company. And I want for the people that are listening, not to feel limited by your capabilities. So like we each have these capabilities, like I, you'd be talking to a trial lawyer right now if I stayed with my capabilities. Right. But that idea of calling, right, which is a little bit murkier, like some people talk about God like they just got off the phone with him. Like he said this and I said this and I said no and he said yes. And um, and I don't have those kind of interactions. Mind, like if I want to understand what God's saying, I'll flip through the scriptures. I'll flip through what Paul had to say in a letter about what God thinks about our world. I'll flip through something that Jesus said or a miracle that he did. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's how I'm just trying to understand these things. Then I find 
writing is really helpful for me. I have a little bit of a bent that way in the first place. So I'm like looking at the 37 miracles that Jesus did. I'm not just looking at the miracle like water into wine. I'm saying what was happening around it. And what Mary said is do whatever he tells you to do. So I'm just trying to think of something really practical, not that like, wow, it's wine, Mm -hmm. but to say what was going on beneath it. That kind of practice has felt like I'd keep my spiritual side more kind of sharpened and focused and engaged. What do you, what kinds of things do you do to like, just kind of keep your faith, not just like academic or in your head, but mm-hmm. to keep it alive. Do you have some practices or some routines that you use? Um, I tell you, my wife is really a big driver in this because I just wasn't one that was kind of diving in every day. Like I should um, for many years and to, to see her example Um, over these last few years, since I've been home on this, uh, for my last trip to space has been amazing. It's helped me to, it's helped inspire me and motivate me. And it's not like I gave up on the Bible or anything. I, you know, I was still, you know, totally engaged going to church and, you know, hopefully leading others and setting a great example, but I just wasn't digging into the word like I should and praying like I should. And so, um, those habits have kind of come back recently, which has been great. And, uh, it's just amazing what, you know, how things open up, like you're kind of alluding to, um, when you're, when you're in scripture, when you're talking to God all the time, the things you just look at the world differently and in different situations differently. Right. So, uh, I've been super blessed that she's kind of been, been leading the way there for me and, uh, I'll catch up yeah. to one of these days. I hope. Yeah. And uh, I've been chasing sweet Marie around that way too. <laughs> she is like the rock in our family. I'm easily distracted. Um, tell me this, uh, I'm 64. So at Bob plus 10, so it's 74. Mm-hmm. I'm still going to be full of pea and vinegar. I'm just going to be <laughs> into it. mischief and probably hopefully not a felony, but like something close by, like I want to uh, stay engaged. I want to stay engaged in other people's lives. I'd love to, like, I like building schools. And so I imagine that 10 years from now, you'd see me doing some of the same things and you see where I'm headed this. What, tell me Shane plus 10, what's the next version. Tell me about that guy. Yeah. I hope I still am very active. Like I am now, um, physically active, um, love working out, love just kind of getting outside and doing things. Um, so hopefully I'm still doing that, uh, but I'm even more engaged. I think kind of like what, what you're talking about is, you know, I want to get more engaged in our community. Uh, we, yeah. we recently moved, so we're in a new community. I want to get way more involved here. Lots of young families around us in this new neighborhood we're in. And and Robbie and I's eyes are just lighting up every day uh-huh. as we see the little kids go by in the box because we know it's such a great opportunity to, to be mentors to them. And so I hope 10 years from now, as, as those kids are now probably getting into high school, maybe we can still be mentoring their parents. Maybe we're teaching their kids in high school. Maybe they're te- we're teaching their kids in Bible study um, or even their parents in Bible study, right? Um, and things like that. So we love getting engaged in the community. And, and since we've just kind of recently moved, we, we're not quite there yet, but we definitely will be there in 10 years. Yeah. And I would encourage people that are listening to think of you plus 10, like just to say, where are you headed? It's not a new concept, but it's often one we like put to the side because you're going to spend a lot more time in your future than you will in your past. (laughs) And so what I want to do is to say, what, what, what changes do I need to make to turn into that guy? And so for me, it would be like less time on airplanes elsewhere. Uh, and so we've had a little bit of an intervention with a talking pillow and like, <laughs> I just had all the people that love me in the circle on purpose. Like I convened it, uh, to just say, Hey, what can we do together to help me get from here to there? And everybody had some great ideas. And so if you're listening, think about who you're becoming, but actually be informed. And this came from Jesus talking to a young person. He said, I'll tell you the truth, unless you change and become like a child, you'll never enter the kingdom of God, which is crazy. It's this childlike faith. And Shane, you're a guy that has taken on some immense, like who could think it experiences and challenges, yet you've maintained that childlike faith. You're a fun guy. Like you're just oh. fun. You're quick oh, to laugh. Which is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all of that context. But so <laughs> what are you going to do to keep the fun factor up? It's going to be working out. It's going to be being involved in other people's lives. What other stuff is just going to be good for you that you're looking forward to? Next version of Shane. 
being a part of our kids' lives as they they're young adults now, and and uh, one of them's married, right? And and so just growing with our new son-in-law and a new part of the family has been are already amazing and awesome. And I we just look forward to that. I look forward to that for the next you know ten years of just being being there um, more than I have been obviously in the past due to due to various commitments I had, but. Um, being there for them as they kind of reach milestones in their lives, as they get married, as they have children, as they, you know, lead a Bible study, as they do other things um, that I know they're on a path to do. So it's just going to be fun being a part of their world. Um, and it's not my world anymore. And it was for a minute. And uh, I never wanted to think of it like that, but it kind of was, unfortunately. Um, and now it's not. So it, now it's other other people's minutes and my family and friends are are ones that hopefully I can really dig into over these next handful of years. Yeah. I've always thought about that with our kids. Like if they wanted to make pizzas, I'd grow tomatoes. <laughs> like it just whatever it is, <laughs> so whatever great. it is that gets me in proximity to them during this time. And I think that has to do with legacy. I got one last question, then we'll wrap up. I think you've got a book in you. I'm not trying to call you out in front of everybody, <laughs> but like, buddy, you've got like so many things to say. Does that ever sparkle for you a little bit because i want to read that one i want to hear what you have to say about life and faith and hope and challenges and ambiguity and the things that you're certain about and the things you're guessing about do you, does that ever appeal to you um it's been mentioned quite a few times um, no doubt to, to answer your question it, it hasn't truly appealed to me um but there are so many great lessons that, that we've been through as, as a family as a couple um, they certainly can inspire others. And just due to that piece of it, um, I think something needs to get out there. Now, whether that's me writing it or Robbie writing it, um, uh. or we, both, we both write it, you know, maybe something from her perspective that we've gone through some serious things, you know, obviously experiences with work, but medical things as well, like every family goes through, but we just think we can be, uh, encouragers, honestly, for, for your listeners and for others out there at some points, um, to get it down on paper. So I appreciate your your uh, confidence. In that. Oh, I totally. There, but, uh, I'm see. But, uh, I'm I'm on page 29 of that book right now. <laughs> um, and the, and for everybody listening, uh, net the butterflies, the stories, the experiences that you've had. You may not have done a spacewalk, but you've walked outside your front door and tell us about what happened next. And I think that it's in these things. It comes out of Deuteronomy. It's uh, six and eleven. It said the same thing. When you wake up in the morning, talk about what God's done. When you're walking by the way, when you lay down at night, put it over your doorpost, put it on your forehead, wrap it on your hands. Like just just kind of remember what happened. And your kids, kids, kids will be the big beneficiaries of that. Well, Shane, thank you. You're a good Thanks, guy. I am so delighted everybody got to, like we kind of went into space with you for a second. Um, you, you guys have been listening to the Dream Big Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. And here's the deal. The next five minutes are the best five minutes. What I want you to do is not just agree with something you heard Shane say, but say, okay, what am I going to do about that? And so like this idea, like a hope, without a plan is just a wish. And we want to move from wishing about stuff, wishing to be great parents or wishing to be great spouses to say, okay, so here's my plan. I'm going to show up and I'm going to do these things. So thank you. You guys have a great week and blessings on you, Shane. Thanks, buddy. Thanks, Bob.